Office Hours with the Atlantic presented by Lexis. I am Derek Thompson. Uh, I am so excited uh, to be here today with Atlantic Deputy Editor uh, Ross Anderson. Uh, we're here to talk about everything generative AI. I'm not even sure that's necessarily the word that's going to stick or the label that's going to stick. It, generative AI, synthetic AI. We're talking about things like ChatGPT and Dolly 2. Um, I'm very, very excited about this topic. Uh, typically in this space, we talk about progress, the abundance agenda, the frontier of science technology. This is a topic that could touch on everything. I mean, we are talking about tools that may be on the road to something called AGI, artificial general intelligence, which is, you know, could end up being one of the most important all-purpose technologies uh, since uh, electricity, or maybe even more than that. So um, again, quick thanks to our underwriter, Lexis, for supporting the Atlantic. And um, let's jump right in. Ross, hello. Derek, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited. Of course. Uh, first question, generative AI is the coolest technology since blank. How would you fill in the blank? Uh, that's tough. I'm trying to think, and I, I hesitate to age myself um, on this uh, this panel here. But like, uh, when I think about in my adult life, um, the things that have really blown my mind, one that I feel like is overlooked often is Napster. Um, I just remember that uh, having like painstakingly collected even cassette tapes, but also just CDs. The first time someone showed me that you could just like, have any song at your fingertips just like that that was a real revelation then obviously smartphones um are the next one and that that whole the smartphone itself I, I, people forget that it was sort of rickety at first right like the touch screens didn't work really perfectly but then that sort of era three four year three or four years in where you there was an app for everything that moment where it felt like every week you had this new functionality was really cool um I really feel like chat GPT, Dolly, like the, the last 12 months of generative AI really compete with those moments. And, you know, I, I don't want to be, I, I don't want to dunk on crypto in this call, but the contrast is really, really clear, right? Like you had to, people, not me, not you, but people had to laboriously try to kind of like bludgeon you with bullying arguments about how cool and revolutionary crypto was. Whereas Dolly and ChatGPT, like you show it, you put it in front of an eight-year-old, you put it in front of an 80-year-old and have them try it one time. And they're like, wow. Notably, without telling them you're going to get rich. Because I think one of the things that the problem with crypto as a use case is yeah. that the use case was typically, if you bet on these assets, they will just go up and it will make you rich. Like that was a huge, clear use case of it. But at some point, once the use case becomes money, that can obfuscate the underlying utility. The interesting thing to me about ChatGPT is that rather than be money without use cases, which is basically what crypto is, it's yeah. use cases without money. There's no business model here. Like they've just been bought by Microsoft. Um, they just unveiled this sort of subscriber ChatGPT technology that allows people to pay for the data that they're consuming. Um, but I, I share your excitement um, about this. And I also think it's interesting that like, you mentioned Napster and say the iPhone one. Those are both, um, from today's perspective, bad technologies, but they were bad technologies that suggested how that uh, field of technological advance might go forward. They were chapter one in, or, or inning one in a long baseball game. And I also see ChatGPT as like the first half of the first innings. When people say, you know, I think this is too dumb. I think it's it's just merely spitting out what it's regurgitated or what, what it's consumed. It's not demonstrating any uh, creativity. My response to that is typically, you might be right. It, it might be kind of dumb now, but we're looking at a technology that all of the biggest companies in the world are working on trying to advance. And that makes me think that this is just, this is so larval. It's, a, it's like looking at iPhone one and saying, here's all the ways that it's hard to like hear the call come in through AT&T. You're focusing on the wrong problems. They're going to solve the call quality. It's the, it's the, this sort of incredible cornucopia of options opened up by the iPhone that are more interesting. Um, you are working currently in a story about how Dali, the, um, uh, essentially prompt to image technology can be used uh, by patients with aphantasia. Number one, am I saying aphantasia correctly? And number two, wh what does this mean and why does it excite you? Yeah. I, you know, a couple of years ago, we had a, a fellow here at the Atlantic named Annika Nelson. She worked in our archives. I don't know if you remember her. Um, really nice woman. And she had pitched me on a story 
uh, that actually made me feel quite ableist for a second because she described herself as having this condition called aphantasia, which is the inability to form mental images. And I myself, this is one of these classic sort of, um, we all, all of us have a very particular cognition and that can lead to really blind spots in this case, sort of taken literally. Um, I myself am such a visual thinker that the fact that someone could not generate mental images uh, mm -hmm. sort of blew my mind. Like, it's just like, oh, that's weird. Like, how do you think? Like, it's very central to like how I write, how I think. How I read, yeah. How I read, yes, everything. I'm sort of got like an internal dolly mm -hmm. running all the time, right? Um, and uh, in fact, one of the, the first ways I really, and you and I have talked about this before, got interested in generative AI was trying to generate dreams with dolly because those images, right, aren't externalized. So it's trying to like get the computer to generate stuff that previously had only been in my head. Anyway, um, talking with the open AI guys, they mentioned that they've been getting all this feedback from people with aphantasia. Hmm. Uh, I keep writing them in saying that they're using Dolly in order to generate mental images. And for a couple of years now, I've been fascinated with this sort of highfalutin theory called uh, extended phenotype, right? Which is the idea that technologies, the smartphone sort of being the best kind of example, are the, the, the boundary line between like the human phenotype, like the organism and our smartphones is getting blurry and blurry, like that we already are sort of cyborgs. And this struck me just as like a really, really interesting example of that. So yeah, working on a piece like that, don't ask me about that's, the deadline. No, that's such a cool use case. I mean, the, the idea of reconstructing one's dreams is really compelling, but also to a certain extent, if if dreams are just a are are one kind of sensory projection of the human experience, um, you know, visual art is another sensory projection of the human experience. So it's interesting to think that that we can have these tools that'll be like dream amplifiers for us. Whether we're trying to recapture the dreams that we had when we were unconscious, that's very interesting to me. Uh, but also, if you're trying to design a new video game, if you're trying to design, you know, a, a the cover of a of a new book, maybe your next book, maybe my next book. The bit, like when you have an idea in your head that you can't fully express, it's so interesting to think that we can democratize these tools of illustrative projection. And this is just one of the ways in which I think these technologies are just frankly going to be kind of awesome. Now I should pause here to say that we've already got some comments in the comment sections and I, I see you, I'm reading you, I will get to you saying, I don't like the fact that you're starting with how cool this stuff is, how awesome it is. Let's talk about the problems. We're gonna talk about the problems, but I actually wanna put a stake in the ground here and say that I think it's really important to my conception of technology. And Ross, you do not have to sign co-sign this. I'm just gonna make my own a thesis statement. I think it's really important to look at new tech through a lens of relatively open-minded curiosity. Like there's mm. always time to think about who will chat GPT replace in the workforce? What mm -hmm. kind of intellectual property concerns are there of a technology that is reading, consuming the entire internet and then synthesizing it for um, individual prompts? There are interesting problems here to think about, but I wanna start with sort of open-minded uh, curiosity. Ross, have you used ChatGPT at all in your, in your writing, whether you're playing with it and just being like, you know, whatever, write me a, um, an explanation of, how the search for extraterrestrial intelligence works, but in the style of the King James Bible, or like how how have you used or played with this technology? Uh, yeah, you know, so first I have queried it um, about like some philosophical issues that I'm writing. Like it, you may, I am writing a book about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, as you suggest. And so I, I did ask it like, sort of like, if we made first contact, what would you ask, you know, an extraterrestrial just to see what it would say? And it, it gave me like, a fairly standard chat GPT answer, which sort of like um, synthesized kind of uh, like uh, current conventional wisdom on that subject, you know, like it would ask it for new scientific laws and, you know, if there are any exist or technologies that humans did not know about previously, blah, 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 blah. Um, one of the most interesting and functional, uh, I flatter myself that my writing style cannot be uh, reproduced by chat GPT, at least not as of yet. yet. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, one of the really interesting things that I have done with it is, um, you know, we all get, when you're writing something longer, right, you get into that moment where you sort of lose the forest for the trees. And so I have been sort of midway on a draft, like been somewhere at like 3,000 to 4,000 words on something when the thing is getting really blurry for me and I'm not ready to invite an editor into it yet. 
And so I've dumped the thing into chat GPT and been like, what is this piece about? <laughs> yeah. And have it generate like a kind of like four sentence abstract that just reminds you like, oh yeah, that is what this piece is about. Um, and you're not, I've never used any of the language um, from it in part because it wasn't that good, but like it just, it, it did help reorient me in, in kind of the larger question I was writing about. That makes me think of something that I, di I didn't expect to talk about with you, but um, the summary skills of ChatGPT are very interesting because yes. what they do is not particularly sophisticated. They kind of discover the average of human output, right? Like that, that's, that's why it's so good at imitating old styles because old styles are reproduced a lot in the internet, right? The King James Bible is everywhere. Um, Shakespearean style is everywhere online. It's very easy to find, you know, all of Shakespeare's works on the internet. So it's very good at reproducing the average of Shakespeare, the King James Bible. Sometimes when you're writing, you want to understand what would the average person think of this passage, right? I'm lost in this. What would, what would a totally average person get out of this passage? And that's not a particularly intelligent thing. It's actually unintelligent. It's, it's, it's average yeah. intelligence. But it's so useful sometimes to learn what would an average person think about this writing. I've never thought about using it like that, but um, I'm going to I'm going to steal that. That's very cool. I've been using it well, sometimes. Oh, jump right in. I, yeah, I would say well, the other thing, just to your point, um, it's a good replacement for some of the low key child labor that I've uh, been uh, tasking my kids with inside the house, because I will sometimes in a piece of writing, stick it in front of my 13 year old and be like, hey, I want you to bold every sentence that you don't understand not as a test for him, but for my own purposes. We're like, okay, where am I going too high in this piece? Because I, I feel like good writing, even on the Atlantic, should be not completely, but like, but like pretty legible, I feel like, to like a smart 13-year-old. Mm -hmm. Right, right. The point is not to make the writing at a 13-year-old level, but rather when you depart from that level of simplicity, to depart knowingly and deliberately, rather than to sort of wander your way into something that's too arcane for you know, a smart freshman to understand. Um, you wrote a really interesting piece for The Atlantic about this idea that the generative models are, are training on uh, text data that is essentially the corpus of the internet, um, mm -hmm. but that eventually they might run out. They might consume all of textual culture on the internet and then run out of stuff. Like what happens at that moment? Talk us a little bit through about how you thought of that piece and what some of the more interesting or haunting implications from uh, that reporting were. Yeah, I mean, you explain it well, but just to just to expand on that, just to touch, um, uh, it's no secret that large language models like GPT-3 and now GPT-4 is coming very, very soon, uh, that they've gotten better because of the scale of data they've ingested, right? Like these have not been huge breakthroughs in algorithm design uh, or in architectures. They've been about shoveling more and more and more data, more text that we have into and, and letting them learn predictably from it. Um, and, you know, to us, like anyone who's sort of intellectually minded at all has had the kind of enlightenment dream of being able to read everything that's ever been written. And I, I feel like someone did the calculation at some point that like the last time this was possible was in like 300, you know, uh, AD or something like that. Um, but it hasn't been possible for a very long time for a human. But as it turns out, because AI can suck down text so fast, um, they're closing in on high quality text. And I want to be clear about what I mean about high quality text. That's books, uh, magazine articles, particularly Atlantic articles, uh, scientific papers, um, and uh, and Wikipedia, incidentally. Um, and uh, low quality text uh, like tweets um, and just sort of fragment, uh, random fragments of, of text from the internet, these actually don't work well as training data when they when they try to train LLMs, you know, GPT-3 is an LLM, uh, on tweets and, and things like that, they actually, they get bad results. Like it's just not a very good writer when it's trained on that. So you need books and something like, you know, between 10 and 50 million books have been digitized already and it's almost done with those. And so the worry here is that we've seen these huge breakthroughs and we're about to see another one, right? GPT-4 is, is probably weeks away um, from being released. And that's gonna be exciting. We're gonna see something really, we'll see what it does when it comes out, but 
that innovation has really been powered by scale of data. And it, it looks like by 2027, we might be out of brand new text to feed these things. It's uh, what are you looking most forward to with GPT-4? Um, you know, I, I will confess that uh, talking to some of the people at OpenAI, they've said to me rather provocatively that it can see. Um, and, and I'm not sure what to make of that. Uh, and, and can obviously see in a way that's different um, than Dolly 2. And so I don't know if that means reading charts, uh, but in essence, I'm, I'm looking for a more refined text model that's not as error-ridden um, mm -hmm. as ChatGPT has done. And then just something that's more multimodal, mm -hmm. right? Something that can switch back and forth between images and text or can use them in tandem. I mean, if you link up Dolly, uh, and chat GPT. Uh, I'm looking for the next iteration of that. Yeah. I, I joke that chat GPT is nice, but as an economics writer, I would really appreciate chart GPT. And there's really <laughs> no reason why if you had access to all these databases, mm -hmm. you couldn't just spin that up. I mean, there's lots of information that I would love to graph that is just based on federally collected data that lives on either census.gov or bls.gov or some it, it, it lives in some data source that can be kind of difficult for me to find. And the census is, is infamously hard to penetrate in terms of where exactly is the data that you want to find. But if I just say, you know, I would love to know, adjusted for inflation, how much Americans spent on chicken every year going back 150 years. It's a pretty mm -hmm. interesting question, but it actually is very, very, very difficult to hunt down, that, hunt down that information. If there was some way to do that, to accelerate that process, even if it took an hour and a half for this, you know, genius brain to scour the webs and find that stuff. That's the sort of digital assistant that would be extraordinarily useful to me. You're essentially creating a technology that is 10,000 interns on speed, but you're paying $10 a month for it. I mean, that's the sort of thing where it's not necessarily replacing writers. I think it's much better to think of it as, you know, the bicycle for the mind, something that makes writers' jobs much easier because you can produce sophisticated intelligence a little bit faster. Um, I want to ask a follow-up question about mm -hmm. this, this interesting dream or interesting reality that um, LLMs like ChatGPT might run out of quality training data. And that is the question of, is it possible that we are right now in this kind of honeymoon period, this efflorescence of enthusiasm for these technologies, but that like five years from now, 10 years from now, AI will follow the same trajectory as something like self-driving cars, where people, including myself, absolutely no question, got way, way ahead of themselves. Said in like 2015, 2016, the streets of my city are going to be strewn with self-driving cars in five, six years. It's, it's absolutely coming. And then it just didn't. Like this, this technology just got stuck at the 11th hour problem or the last mile problem, so to speak. Um, do you share any, any, any concern or maybe outlook on the possibility that we're getting really, really excited for a technology to advance exponentially, but that there might just be some invisible ceiling that it's going to hit relatively soon? I do. And, and I will confess that I do not have the technical expertise to like genuinely handicap that as to how quickly we might run into that wall. But um, look, I, I think when you look at <clears throat> the business of AI prognostication going back to the 1950s, um, it's it's been a bit of a sucker's game. Mm -hmm. uh, AI winters have sort of dropped out of the sky um, at kind of pretty regular intervals, and, and many of them were not anticipated. And so, and, and this AI springtime um, also was not anticipated. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I thought sort of the juice had been squeezed out of machine learning and that we are kind of getting into a pretty incremental space. Like I loved Google Translate and, and all the other sort of translation um, uh, applications that seemed to me to be one of the most, uh, you know, fascinating and, and, and kind of Useful. exciting developments. Um, same with, you know, computer vision, obviously in the last 10 years has gotten extraordinary before Dolly, but I thought we were kind of done. And then generative AI just, you know, really comes out of nowhere. I mean, that's not even a word that people are using one year ago today in like buzzy tech spaces. The very last podcast of Crazy Genius that I did, which was a, a, a podcast I did with The Atlantic that ended in maybe like 2018, was yeah. about generative design. And generative design was a term that came out of the combination of machine learning and architecture 
And it was this idea that I talked to someone at, at Google X about it, this idea that, oh, maybe architects of the future could design new buildings or maybe um, material scientists could design new kinds of material like super strong concrete by yeah. having an AI essentially help them dream up new concepts for uh, a bridge or uh, you know reinforced concrete at the molecular level. And Astro Teller had this lovely phrase where he said, it's best to think of generative design AIs as being like a dumb genie. They're, <laughs> they, they, they do what you want them to do, but over, -liter over literally. So yeah. his, the example that he always gives is you tell the generative design to make a peanut butter sandwich and it takes two slices of bread and like a handful of peanut butter and this is if it's a robot and like throws it on a table. And it's like, I made peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's like, no, 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 the, 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 the bread has to go here and then here and then the, it comes in the middle. And then it messes up a couple more times. Then finally it makes a, a adequate a PB and J. And as, and as it was reflecting on that conversation, I thought this is exactly what talking to chat GPT is like. You ask it a relatively sophisticated question and it comes back with an answer that's like, you know, eighth grader Wikipedia. And you're like, no, 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 like a little bit more sophisticated. And then you can kind of begin to work with it. And, yeah. uh, and so yeah, you, you made me think that, that we were beginning to see generative um, technologies, but I thought it was going to be much more, um, much more visually focused. So it utterly shocked me when I saw that it was textually focused. Speaking of yeah. this working trajectory, oh. oh, jump right in. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say, yeah, you think about this even in the magazine, right? Like we're... AI is a huge story right now where we want to assign stuff, you know, there's, there's, I'm just peeking behind the curtain here. We want to assign stuff that's going to be relevant in six months. Well, mm. think about like last August, if we assembled all the like technology minds at the Atlantic and we said like, oh, you know, what, what should we be focused on, you know, for a piece that's going to come out five, six months from now, a lot, most people would have said something related to Dolly or stable diffusion because those that was the generative AI that's hot. And then what, two months later, chat GPT drops and everyone's obsessed with that. Now we would have totally missed the boat. So I, I hope that we're still in that exciting phase, by the way, in the next year where it's really hard to predict. But to your point, maybe we hit one of those walls and we're just in diminishing returns for a while. And we have these chat bots that are like, good, but sort of brittle and inaccurate in ways that make them like not terribly useful. And the next iteration, the like dream version is still five, 10 years away. I just, I, I don't know when to pretend to. But Jan LeCun, uh, who is a, a famous um, AI researcher who now I believe is the chief AI researcher at Meta, the company that owns Facebook. He said that LLMs, large language models are an off-ramp on the road to AGI, um, which is to say he thinks that this is a cute, distraction. Can you talk a little bit about that mode of thinking, which yeah. is definitely emergent in the AI space and what, what sense you make of it? Yeah. And again, I, and I, I don't mean to hide behind this, but obviously I would defer to his technical expertise. Um, uh, you know, he's looking under the hood of these things, but I, I feel two ways about it, to be honest. Um, uh, on the one hand, I feel like, well, you know, whether that's true or not, the reason that chat GPT has been so compelling for almost everyone, 99% of the, the people that have used it, possible exception of our colleague Ian Bogost, um, is just that like, it, it's amazing, it, the things it does most resemble what we imagine will come from an AGI, right? And just to pause an AGI being an artificial general intelligence that instead of being smart in just one domain, like playing chess or playing Go, has a flexible mind like everyone on this call has, right? That you can sort of, it can look at different tasks and, and have some kind of baseline level of competence and understanding, uh, no matter sort of what you throw at it. Um, and so chat GPT does things and maybe humans are just over dazzled by language. You're also seeing some of that in the discourse that we're just like, whoa, it's using our words, you know, and <laughs> that's right. We're sort of like getting too excited about that. Um, but either way, uh, whether or not like, I don't know if it's an off-ramp, but I do know that it's doing the most, the kind of sexiest, most AGI-like things that I've ever seen. However, one thing it's not doing, you know, sort of on the other hand is insight. Like when you query it, as I was saying earlier, it generates kind of conventional wisdom. It tells you what it thinks you want to hear. And I think for me, I'd be much more excited and think that we were further along on the AGI road if it were generating insight, if, for instance, we were to sort of dump the corpus of 
uh, astronomical data into one of these things. And it were coming and it came back to us and said, yeah, you know, I, your theory is great. Nice job, humans. But like, here are some more elegant laws that actually have more explanatory power for what's going on in the universe. Oh, also, I read, you know, the entire Virginia Woolf canon. And have you ever noticed how, it, you know, she uses these secondary characters for like these specific narrative functions that would tell me like, oh, okay, this thing is now, it, this thing is actually doing something akin to what we think of as thinking. I think it's very meaningful that one of the most impressive use cases of LLMs like ChatGPT right now is parody. And this is a point that I, I think I probably just made 20 minutes ago, but I'll make it again in a different way. Parody is easy for, or at least within reach for, a technology that is very good at essentially mirroring human textual output, but not going above it because it can mirror the quality of the King James Bible um, or some other ancient text. And it can incorporate something like, you know, uh, a political scandal of the 1970s about which there's a lot of other texts on the internet. And it can sort of just push those two parts of the peanut butter and jelly sandwich together. But yeah. what it can't do is exceed, right? It's not yet good it's synthesizing intelligence that we have not produced a lot of textually, right? And that's what we want from say AlphaFold, which is the technology that, it sent, that anticipates protein design. That's what we want from science where it anticipates molecules that we haven't thought of. So it's still, I think, very good at parity because parity is just the synthesis of established human intelligence, but not going above the level of parity, which is like true novel synthetic breakthroughs which go beyond that which we've already provided. Maybe I'm just saying the same thing over and over again, but that, that to me seems like a core point in terms of thinking through the intelligence and or stupidity of this technology as it stands. Yeah, that's right. It, it, it only, achieve, it goes beyond parity in its speed, right? Like, yes. you know, when it does, the one that was floating around where it's like, explain how to take, we really ended up in the peanut butter and jelly space in a funny way, but like, it's like explain how you would take like peanut butter toast out of a toaster and do it in the King James. Uh, uh, one, one, of, one of the best prompts in the history of, of the use case of the technology. Yeah, Unbelievable. Yeah. Everyone you show that to it, it, like their jaw was dropped. And the thing that was impressive is like you and I are, are two like really hyper verbal guys. And if you stuck us in like a conference room here at the Atlantic and we had all day to do that. We, you know, we, after like a few hours, we could turn out like something that was pretty good, maybe not that good. And it would take us a long time. It took that thing like five seconds. That's crazy. Yeah, exactly. Um, last question for you before we get to some really, really cool questions from um, from the audience. Um, you're deep into a project right now on SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, do you think AI is alien? Gosh, that's such a good question. I've thought about that a lot and, you know, writing about AI recently um, here at the Atlantic, coming back from, I've spent like sort of like the last nine months writing my book about, you know, the, the possibility that there's intelligence elsewhere in the cosmos. And so I have had to perhaps more occasion than others to sort of think about the difference between the two. And maybe I've just been uh, generative AI pilled, but just thinking about the way that we've trained these things, uh, it strikes me that they're not alien at all. Hmm. Like they're trained entirely on the corpus of human cultural production. They hmm. are all of us, you know, in a way that I think is is uh, is really interesting. And and I'm kind of excited to see the discourse around them. Change. Like it, it feels to me like there's a kind of um, impoverished space of metaphors that people have to where they're they're automatically going to like, oh, these things are alien minds and alien technologies, and it's like they're sort of downstream from humans actually. And, yeah. and they are, uh, yeah, everything about, they know about the world they got from us and and they're they're even, they're like situated in the same place in the universe as us. So, you know, their physical environment, everything is like they're, I feel like we're gonna, you know, if our AGI dreams come true, it's, it's, it's a story of co-evolution rather than kind of visitation and first contact. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, I mean, you could say rather than extraterrestrial intelligence, it's truly intraterrestrial intelligence. It's the it's the it's the mirror reflection of the intelligence we've already created, but served back through us in a remixed kind of techno way. A um, couple of fun questions from the audience. Uh, these are I'm going to give you sort of an, an omnibus opportunity to talk about some of the downsides that you're most keen on talking about, because there's many possible downsides of a new sort of platform technology being 
introduced. One, David Carr asked about uh, the onrush of people trying to position themselves as chat GPT consultants. Um, this is, I think there's a light side, dark side. We want technologies to open up new jobs. On the other hand, there's no question that novel technologies open up the opportunity for BS jobs. Um, and that will, that will surely happen here. Um, there were some questions about the degree to which this might um, reinforce groupthink among users, among corporations and government. If this is just a mere reflection of our intelligence remixed back to us, um, are there dangers in terms of like how ideology is coded into some of these technologies? You know, I could imagine a future, for example, where there's a liberal chat GPT, there's a libertarian chat GPT, there's a conservative chat GPT. Basically, you take the underlying LLM transformer technology, but you give it the spin of a certain ideology, you know, um, say this stuff is true, say this stuff isn't true. That could be a kind of interesting implication. And mm -hmm. finally, there was a question about the implications for songwriting and music composition, um, because it's possible to create images that are songs themselves, such that if you play the image, the image is a kind of soundscape. Um, I don't have the vocabulary perfect here, but the same way that Dolly can create images that look like you know a field, they can also create images that can be played as pieces of music. And so there are kind of chat GPTs or transformer-based technology for writing original song, music composition. That could be an interesting future that could either replace or amplify um, uh, composers. Um, any of those really like strike a chord in a um, possible a downside that you want to talk about? Yeah, uh, by the way, and, and Google just published uh, a text to music um, LLM. They they didn't make it available, but they showed the comp and it was crazy. It was like, you know, do a, a spacey sci-fi reggaeton um, uh, song that does X, Y, and Z and the, and the outputs were, were really, really sophisticated. So I take that seriously. Um, as far as like the kind of uh, chat GPT generating like a cottage industry of grifters who are consultants or whatever, um, I, I just feel like that's true of every industry. I mean, it's not something that feels specific to this technology. And it, if we are worried about it, like, again, let's, let's go back to crypto and solve, <laughs> solve those problems where there, it seems like there were millions of people doing that. Mm -hmm. um, the one that I, I, I'm really intrigued culturally by this notion that you were describing that uh, there's some concern that sort of the conventional wisdom might be endlessly reified um, and that, you know, this will sort of smooth out the kind of useful spikiness of culture. Um, I'm not sure that's going to happen. And, and I think it, if it's the case and you know, um, adopting your abundance frame. If if it's if it's like true that this technology is actually going to lead to greater abundance, I I think actually I I just maybe I'm naive, but I feel like it's going to free people up to do more thinking. Um, it's going to sort of uh, remove some of the barriers to thinking, especially if you know, as you said, if we start getting these kind of big standardized database of like economic data or whatever else it might be. Um, that's going to lead to actually more originality uh, than than we've had previously, but also you know search algorithms, Wikipedia, these things also sort of smooth down difference in culture. So this is a phenomenon that's already been with us. I, I wouldn't say any of those. Um, uh, none of that gives me so much pause. I I do have some concern about um, visual artists when it comes to Dolly. Uh, it does just understanding that the the creative economy in the visual arts is really so impoverished uh, once you get down beneath kind of like a handful of um, contemporary artists and and you know like Pixar and some of the big animation studios that the market for those skills has sort of been shrinking for a long time and you know um, illustration work has been a really a good a good way for people to sort of keep themselves afloat uh, while they're trying to make it big. And there's no question that Dolly is just gonna nuke um, a huge portion of the kind of like the, the lower end of the illustrator market um, where people would have sort of been able to kind of hold on and make a living for a while. So I'd say that concerns me for sure. Yeah, I wanna merge a couple questions from uh, Meredith and Jeff to close us out. Um, Jeff uh, brings up Annie Lowry's article about how chat GPT and similar technologies could destabilize white collar work. And Meredith asked a question about being a college professor and you know wondering about how much we should embrace AI. And I wanna merge those questions in this way. Given that we know that there are companies like OpenAI that are working on 
artificial general intelligence, a technology that could be broadly destabilizing across entire swaths of the economy that whose job is to essentially read and synthesize reading or produce things like images. How should we begin to think about training the next generation of students for using these tools to make them to make them as individuals harder to fully automate because they know how to use these tools as like use them as a horse, right? Know how to ride the tools rather than do what say cars did to horses and replace us entirely. I don't know. I mean, I, I find myself for some reason skeptical of the like the hype around like the next career is going to be prompt engineer. Um, I don't, something about that strikes me as implausible for reasons I can't articulate. Um, Nonetheless, you know, in terms of what I'm putting into practice myself, like, look, I've got a 13 and a nine year old and I've been throwing them in front of Dolly and chat GPT and but not with like, you know, hardcore instructions to to train up, you know, and like to learn to code on generative AI, but more just like, hey, go play. Because mm -hmm. look at the people who were successful and who did genuinely world changing things from, for instance, the computing revolution in the 80s and 90s. It was because they were playing. Right. They were like. They got interested in some application in computing and then said, I want to know how this thing works under the hood. And they started experimenting. Um, and so I feel like these tools aren't really, that's where they're at right now, you know? Um, and so I just would encourage people to to get in there and, and try and make cool stuff. But uh, look, again, as we were talking about earlier, I mean, what would the advice have been like eight months ago mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. the generative AI. I, I just, I feel like um, I want to let the dust settle a little bit before we start making like long-term career advice for like people who are adolescents or whatever it might be. I think it's a great answer. Yeah. There's a great book by Stephen Johnson called Wonderland about how many technological revolutions come from essentially just play. Um, yeah. I also, you make me think like, I think it's important in the long run to have conversations about things like, you know, if this is going to be broadly transformative and um, displacing, like where does UBI come in? Like where do certain like government policies come in in order to account for the destabilization of new technologies? But I think you're right that it, while conversations about that, it's always it's always a good time to talk about the future. But you do want to see a little bit more evidence that the apocalypse is it, that the apocalypse is beginning to come before you start thinking about exactly how to solve it. Um, anyway, Ross Anderson, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure to talk to you about this. Um, it's all the time we have right now, but you can read more of theatlantic.com and in our new print issue. And if you enjoyed this conversation, want more from The Atlantic, you can support our journalism by becoming a subscriber. So again, thanks to Ross for joining us and thanks to our underwriter Lexus for supporting The Atlantic's journalism today. Uh, thanks so much and uh, we will talk to you soon.